In 1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for Space Vidcast. This is Space Vidcast Live 316 for, Ju what is it, July 16th? It's not 316, it's 324 for July 16th, it is. 2010. My name is, my name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, is a beautiful, lovely, and wonderful Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We're your Space Vidcasters. And joining us tonight is Dennis Wingo. You might be familiar with some of his work over at the Orbital, Orbital Recovery Corporation, helping to develop ways to extend the lifespan of satellites. He also works uh, at, <laughs> and this is actually where he's joining us from, at a McMoons, which is a converted McDonald's. And that's on the Lunar Orbiter Data Recovery Project. And tonight, he's going to join us to talk about his book, Moonrush. So Dennis, welcome to Space Vidcast. Thank you, thank you very much. I want one of those shirts. <laughs> yeah, these are awesome. These are the uh, these are the Yuri shirts. I think you can get them at the uh, Yuri'sNight.net website, or at, the, at least Tim, I think, hooked us up. Yeah. Tim Bailey, who is hopefully joining us we'll in the show. We'll give you some links, Dennis. We'll, we'll hook you up. Cool. Hey, so let's get right into this. Um, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about the moon and why, because you know, Moon Rush is all about going, you know, going back to the moon and how it's sustainable. We did Apollo. We did flags and footprints. And you know, us as space geeks, we say, yeah, we should go back to the moon. We've got to go back to the moon and go on to Mars. But you know, my, my family and friends, they go, why? It doesn't impact me. Who cares? So the question for you, just to start it off, is why go to the moon? Who cares? Well, and the fact that in the general public that it is not more acknowledged why we go back to the moon is our own fault in the space advocacy world. Um, after the death of the Apollo program, uh, Werner von Braun set up the National Space Institute, which was later merged and became the National Space Society, to educate people of why it's important to do space exploration and development. And there is an unfortunate lag that happened after the Apollo era in developing, analyzing, and publishing the scientific results. And some of the scientific results from Apollo were simply not believed until this year. And I'll go into a little bit of that. And, but the reason the moon is important, and I put this in the tagline of my book, is that we go to Mars to take our civilization there. We go to the moon to help save our civilization here on the Earth. Uh, you hear discussion all the time. It's in the blogosphere. It, Al Gore is one of the preachers of this, that uh, the Earth doesn't have enough resources to sustain our civilization over time, and China and India and the United States and the Western world were eating up all the resources of the world. And as I explained in my book, uh, the World Wildlife Federation put out a press release saying that we would need the equivalent of two more Earths to sustain our civilization. Well, my answer was, great, guess what? We've got several thousand of them, and we can begin at the moon. And the central thesis behind my book is that there's many of us, and I'm one of them, that have talked about uh, mining asteroids and developing the resources that are on asteroids that are orders and orders of magnitude larger than on the Earth, 
But in thinking about it, it's a two-year round trip. And so I begin with the moon with the premise that if we know from statistically three out of every 100 of the craters on the moon is from a, a nickel, iron, and platinum group metal object hitting the moon. So let's look for some of those objects on the moon. Let's see what's in the record uh, from the Apollo era and see if we can't start to develop these resources. And I go into that in great detail in my book. But Buzz Aldrin himself, who, by the way, has been to the moon, has basically said uh, it's it's magnificent desolation. It's, it's barren. There's nothing there of value. We shouldn't go back to the moon. And he argues we should go straight to Mars. Is there any reason for us to actually try to go back to Luna? Or should we, we just skip that and go right on to Mars itself? Well, you know, most people have said that about Afghanistan. But guess what? We just found $2 trillion worth of uh, mineable materials in Afghanistan. Who would have thought? We didn't know that it was there until we actually went there and looked. And the marvelous thing about the Apollo program is, and this is something that most people don't realize, is that all of the remote sensing that we've done of the moon from orbit is calibrated by the ground truth of the Apollo samples that Buzz and Neil got, as long as several other of the, uh, the, the crews that went to the moon. But what is not understood is the extent of the resources and, and Buzz is a friend and we talk and we have a, a friendly discussion about this and uh, Gordon Woodcock former uh, chief scientist at Boeing said it best going to the Mar going to Mars versus the moon is easy it just takes 10 times more money <laughs> now looking at how much difficulty we have right now in getting the money just to go to the moon uh, where's the money going to come from to, to skip the moon and go to Mars? It is our thesis in our community that by going to the moon and exploiting the resources of the moon, we enable ourselves to not only go to Mars for flags and footprints, we don't want another generation to where, you know, Buzz was 38 when he went to the moon, and I just talked to him the other day. He's 80, he's 80 years old now, almost 80 years old. I don't want another Buzz Aldrin talking about doing the next thing beyond flags and footprints on Mars 50 years in the future after that. We, we need to look at what it costs and what the return on the investment is and how that return on investment helps improve life on the Earth. And the moon is absolutely 100% the first step in that and it, it is the place that will enable the development of not only Mars, but the rest of the solar system. Well, let's talk about that for a moment because, uh, y you know, you, you talked about the, the cost of going to, the, going to Mars being 10 times out of going to the moon, but l let's not, you know, going to the moon is expensive, is very expensive. Uh, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it takes a lot of money. It's not something that just a little startup can, you know, kind of come up with and do. Real, realistically, it's probably going to take a government's money to be able to go back to the moon. In order for that to be realistic, we're going to have to win the hearts and minds of the population that, that lives within that government. Is that something that's doable as space advocates? Is that something where we can get out there and convince people that, no, no, really, even though you can't see it or touch it, and even though it may take 50 years for it to be a reality in your life, this is something worth doing? You don't remember when Andy Griffin went back to the moon in 1979? <laughs> Didn't James Bond go as well at some point? Yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, but in a way, uh, and I saw this at the time and I was fascinated and I, I've seen it again in the last couple of years and I was blown away. Uh, Andy Griffin, there was a movie called Salvage One from 1979 and Andy Griffin had been a junk dealer in Florida and he bought all this surplus NASA stuff and somebody told him that the stuff we left on the moon was worth several billion dollars. So he put together a mission to go to the moon to get that stuff to come back and sell it. American capitalism at its best, but, you know, in, in truthfulness, we have to look at, you know, and you're right, space advocates, but looking in history, and this is why I do a historical overview in my book of things like Robert Fulton's steamship. It was a game changer. It changed everything. Uh, before that, it was James Watt's steam engine. 
and then the Transcontinental Railroad. Some of these were privately funded, some were publicly funded. Going to the moon without the government you're not going to go directly there, but uh, we there's a lot of us that have looked at this, looked at this issue, and say that we wanted to go to the moon, but no venture capitalist in their right mind is going to write a check for that, and even cowboy investors aren't going to do that right away. But what if you could go part of the way there? What if, and this is what I actually work on in my company. What if by building uh, on-orbit assembled space platforms that can be used in geosynchronous orbit to make money to broadcast videos back to the Earth, and that's a, uh, the geoconcept business is very profitable. In, in energy terms, it is closer to the moon than it is to low Earth orbit in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, geo orbit is something like more than three quarters of the way to the moon. Well, if I'm three quarters of the way to the moon and I'm making money in geo orbit and I have assets up there, it's not that much more difficult to take the next step and go to the moon. So, <clears throat> can private enterprise do it? Well, you got to have somebody dedicated. You got to have somebody that knows how to make money in geo orbit. And then leverage from there. I actually do think it's possible. I think it's difficult, but I think it's possible. But obviously, if the government is helping to pay the upfront capital and infrastructure costs, it is much easier. But everything that you just talked about in going to the moons, it's on steroids if you're trying to go to Mars. You know, we got a really good question from the chat room, and that is, do you care if humans go back to the moon? Or, I mean, it's cheaper and way easier and safer for robots to do it. And if we're talking about mining resources, robots can mine those resources. So There is a robot on the cover. There is. Actually, there's uh, a, like a Robonaut looking type thing on the cover. Oh. Um, there you go. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you care if it's a human or can it be a robot? Obviously, in the beginning, it's going to be robots. Robots are what we call force multipliers. And uh, a friend of mine who is an astronaut came up with a very good metric, I think, in that regard, is for large-scale development, which is why developing an industrial infrastructure is. It's going to be about 90% done by robots. But the 10% that is done by humans, which is to help set up the worksite for the robots and to help maintain the robots, is the critical 10% that enabled the 90% to happen. Another interesting aspect of the moon is that after you're there and you're doing things, it's only what? It's uh, th about three seconds round trip uh, from the Earth to the moon light-wise, so you can do telepresence and have people like today, it, when the oil wells are drilled in Africa or in the deep gulf and things like that, the well Bit, the drill bits themselves are not controlled by the guys on the rig. They're controlled by a guy in a control room in Houston or Abu Dhabi that is looking at the remote sensing data in real time and guiding the bit. It's going to be a combination, but I do think that it is absolutely critical for that other 10% because without that 10% that's humans, the other 90% is not feasible, and I tell you, if it was feasible today to go all robotic, uh, GM and uh, Damlier and these other companies would have fired their workers on the production line a long time ago. <laughs> but they did, they, you know, they did transition to a good chunk of robotics, as you mentioned. I mean, I, I don't know if that's what. It's about 90-10. So there you go. Let's go back. You had mentioned um, space depots in geosync orbit. How do we get to that point? I mean, it, it does take a lot of energy to get to geosynchronous orbit. It's not like we can send up massively huge payloads into geosync. We're sending, I mean, in comparison to what we live with here on Earth, relatively small payloads. Mm -hmm. So how do we get that into a, a depot where we can actually start doing stuff and make it big enough where it, it matters? Because you want to do that in geosynchronous, correct? Yeah, well, we have this marvelous thing called a space station. <laughs> in, low, in low Earth orbit, and, and no kidding, if you, t if you go all the way back to the 1950s, and if you look at 
von Braun and Bonestell and the early pioneers before we ever got into this whole military industrial complex crap with Apollo their mission designs called for the orbital assembly of the spacecraft that went to the moon now we have an orbital assembly facility called the International Space Station that is a marvelous marvelous location to assemble large spacecraft one of the things that we're working on now is to build large geosynchronous communication satellites at the International Space Station that are sent to geo orbit. And one of the things that the critics say, well, the station's in the wrong orbit. Well, no, it's not. Uh, it's in a heck of a lot better orbit than that non existent space station at 28 and a half degrees. Um, <laughs> and 56, uh, 51.6 degrees is actually a better orbit to depart from if you're using ion propulsion. And by using ion propulsion, and buying uh, rides from SpaceX, I can take hardware to the station, have the crew put it together, and send these large communications platforms to GEO. Well, guess what? I've just sent a 50 or 100 kilowatt uh, self-steering, self-guided, uh, self-actuated system up there. All i got to do is send a, a module up there that I can connect humans to, and i got enough power already. And so... I can make money at the same time I'm building my human infrastructure. Now, you, you, gl you glossed over something that I think is kind of important and, and, and really cool is assembly at the ISS of not just the ISS itself, but satellites. How close to reality is that project? Write me a check and I'll start tomorrow. <laughs> so, well, re really, it's really that close. Uh, I was very fortunate to work with some in incredibly good engineers at NASA Langley. And a lot of people like to dump on NASA uh, for their bureaucratic ways, and justifiably so. But the engineers, a lot of the engineers at NASA are just incredible people, and I was very fortunate to work with uh, John Dorsey, Dr. Billy Doggett, uh, Tim Collins, and, and some of the old-timers like Martin Mikulas up there. They're the ones who designed the original truss for the original space station Freedom that was going to be assembled in orbit. The truss was. Well, they went to the ground integrated truss later, but all these guys are still there and their ideas are still sound. And so we worked under one of the NASA Human and Robotic Technologies contracts in 2005, and we designed a multi hundred kilowatt solar electric transportation vehicle or an SETV that allowed us, uh, would allow us very, uh, the, uh, the 60 kilowatt version only weighed 1,000 kilos. SpaceX, I could carry one up in, as a secondary payload on a Falcon 9 to the station. Uh, the 500 kilowatt version, it, it weighed 10,000 kilos. That's one Delta IV flight to the station. And a 500 kilowatt system, I could actually carry a 30 metric ton payload all the way to the moon and return in six months. You know, you, you mentioned uh, 100, you, you're mentioning power requirements that, unless I'm mistaken, um, that would start making Vasmir a reality, would it not? Because right now that's one of the big downfalls is that there's, there's just no way to get that much power up there for well, not, in, you know, kind of moving away from the moon for a moment, but going to Mars in a fairly timely fashion. Or is that, are we still too small? Well, I love Franklin's idea. Franklin is a marvelous guy. I think for uh, the, the data that I've looked at, the um, Vasimir starts to hit its sweet spot at a minimum of about a megawatt. Now, we can do a megawatt. It's just our with our modules that we designed in 2005, it's just in modules uh, to get that, that size of a system. And uh, I think we could do Vasimir under those conditions. Uh, right now, we use Hall thrusters, and uh, Hall thrusters at the power levels we're talking about are marvelous, marvelous systems. But I do think as we go forward, we're getting to the point to where, you know, if we were really going for things, we could make Vasimir do its thing. It was just a, that was just an off, like, you mentioned the, the, the power you could bring up today, which is quite a bit. You said 100 kilowatts, right? Um, well, I mean, just a 1,000-kilo a module is over 60 kilowatts, and so on one, if you take a look at the Falcon 9 trunk, 
going to station, that's 3,000 kilos in the unpressurized compartment. I could take almost 200 kilowatts of system to uh, the station in one flight. So let's go, and power is, you know, power is key, I guess, is really what I'm getting at. It's key for space Absolutely. travel, and it's key here on Earth, too. Well, you know, it's interesting, and we've had these discussions with several people, in that the moon, in the development of the moon and or Mars, in microcosm, presents the same problems that we have today in sustaining and extending our civilization here on Earth. And if you look at the development of a lunar base, you are absolutely 100% constrained or enabled by how much energy you have. That is the same thing that we have here on the Earth. We are either constrained by the lack of energy or enabled by plentiful energy. And so I think a side benefit of doing lunar development will be to help create a virtuous feedback loop to help us here on Earth to understand our own energy needs because one of the things that so many people talk about here on the earth today that oh all we got to do is build wind turbines and solar panels and the world will be fine and the birds will sing and blah 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 well you're not going to run a 10 terawatt civilization on wind turbines and solar panels <laughs> uh, and by doing this design and development on the moon you can help bring to people's minds because the problem today is not we don't have an energy problem, we don't have a resources problem, we have an idea problem, we have an implementation problem of how to acquire the resources and how to develop the energy sources that we already know exist. So this will help our brothers and sisters and our fellow citizens here in the U.S. and the world to understand what it takes to run a civilization. And that can help us back here because once we get, because the moon is, is, has to be self-sufficient on everything, absolutely everything. And so, well, you know, not everything, because just think, the United States isn't self-sufficient. Japan's not self-sufficient. There's no place here, there's no country on Earth outside of maybe Albania that's self-sufficient. And, you know, uh, and, you know, how many, uh, you know, nothing bad about Albania. They've <laughs> changed a lot in the past 20 years, but that was the old joke. Um, you know, I guess today it's North Korea, but... Uh, there's no place on earth that's self-sufficient. The moon's not going to be self-sufficient, but the word is self-sustaining. Okay. By trade and by development and by implementation, not only can it sustain itself, but it can be profitable in that it creates more value than it costs to sustain it. Because if we can't do that, we might as well just hang it up, quit worrying about space, and just go on about our way here on the earth. We can't make the moon. Uh, self-sustaining and profitable. Well, and, and you, I think that's really what it keeps coming back down to is where's the money in the moon? And actually, even beyond that, where's the money in <clears throat> space? Beyond just NASA handing out contracts, where is private industry going to make their money? And it's got to be more than just mining metals on the moon. I mean, you had mentioned that earlier in the show. What else can we do on the moon that will help, uh, you know, essentially create a new uh, economy around space? Well, you know, I, I'm going to cause certain elements of our population to go into conniption fits, but George <laughs> W. Bush in 2004, when he announced the vision for space exploration, said it. On the moon, we will be able to build, build the spacecraft that will take mankind to Mars. And I think that is very doable, and I actually think it's essential because... If you take a look at every single plan that has been put together from 1960 till today and go into Mars, you'll see that you, you have to build the modules, you have to build the rockets, you have to build everything that is going to be used on Mars is built in an aerospace factory here on the Earth. They have to design it for an environment up to 70% of the effort that goes into building an aerospace system is to design it for an environment that it sees for 10 minutes of its life. That's the launch to orbit. And most of that effort could be eliminated if you then, and see another thing we have is this spam in a can. Uh, Orion, you know, could you imagine going to Mars in an Orion capsule 
you know, you're going to have to be really friendly with the people that you go with. <laughs> <clears throat> but it, but see, I was involved in some of these design reference mission, and the last Mars design reference mission I saw for NASA had six or seven Ares five launches and an Ares one launch. That's nuts. That's twenty billion a mission, not sustainable. Forget it. But in what George Bush was talking about, you could actually there's plenty of aluminum on the moon. Plenty of aluminum. The Highlands is full of it. So you process the aluminum there on the Earth using several different methods, and you actually it's much easier to take that aluminum and make aerospace systems that are not just uh oh spam in a can uh, on the on on the ground. <laughs> my thing went to screen uh, saver, and I had to log back in my computer. <laughs> um, so i got to hit my uh, button every now and then. If you were to build a large volume spacecraft on the lunar surface, you don't have to launch it inside this cylindrical fairing. You could just take a big flat platform, strap a whole bunch of RL-10s around it, uh, fill it up, and launch whatever volume you wanted to in the lunar orbit. That becomes an interplanetary transfer vehicle. And this is where my ideas and Buzz Aldrin's come together because one of Buzz's most brilliant ideas is the Mars Cycler. And you're not going to do a Mars Cycler as a spam in a can. And you're never going to build a system large enough here on the Earth without having to have a whole bunch of launches <clears throat> that 80% of every launch is fuel to do this. But if I'm building it on the moon, I can launch it far easier. Single stage to orbit on Earth is you know, we've been working on it for decades now, and it's kind of like that great American novel that you never quite write. We're, we're not getting there. But on the moon, single-stage orbit is easy. We did it in 1969. Hmm. So Damn. build the systems on the moon, launch them into orbit. The moon eventually will be the industrial hub of the inner solar system as a transfer station and also as an industrial plant for building the, the space vehicles that go everywhere else, my opinion. But, okay, so I'm going to come back to this one. Before I do want to talk about, uh, before we go, I do want to talk about uh, you are in uh, McMoons right now, so I want to talk about that. But before we get into that, really quickly, to stress one more time, how do we get from here to there? It feels like we're stuck in this endless Leo, and we just can't get out of low Earth orbit. We don't seem to have, it's not a technological problem. It seems like if we put the minds to it, you, you've brought up brilliant ideas in the show. It seems like it's a willpower issue. Where does that willpower come from? Well, willpower, again, this is the flip side of, you know, you say can private enterprise can do it, but hell, the government can't do it. Uh, um, Where's something I read that says, you know, uh, if we could put a man on the moon, why can't we put a man on the moon? You know, <laughs> how many times have you heard that? And, and that's really been the case in the past, ever since the end of the Apollo era. Mm -hmm. Our own community has not put forth the compelling argument of why we should be doing this. But let me go back take a look at what happened in night in the spring of 1968 was the critical year the Tet Offensive the chaos at the Democratic Convention in 1968 at that same time the US Congress decided to end the production of the Saturn V but just think if NASA's budget at four and a half percent of the total federal budget had maintained constant since 1968, it'd be 180 billion dollars a year this year. Just think, we'd be halfway to Alpha Centauri by now. <laughs> but our political leadership, that is mostly lawyers, who are who by training train out the vision part of their brain, uh, we we just we haven't had any political leadership <clears throat> with the vision or the brains or the guts to just push it forward and make it happen. And this is why I go back to the flip side of your question a while ago is that can private enterprise do it? Can our government do it? And, you know, the being very close to what's been happening over the past few years with the vision for space exploration, the ESAS architecture, everything there, 
I don't know if the government's ever going to be able to do it, but guess what? We've got a space station. We've got an anchor in low Earth orbit where commercial enterprise at least is able to get a foothold. I think it, at a minimum for private enterprise, that's sufficient. And I think that we can work from there and do it. If we, uh, and, and there was a great movie. Um, this movie was When Worlds Collide from the 1950s, and I didn't realize this. My wife is a great fan of this movie, and I, I, and I hadn't seen it in 30 years. And at the end of the day, the spaceship that saved the only people that made it away from the Earth was built by private enterprise. It wasn't built by the governments because nobody believed that, uh, the scientists that said that we needed to do this. Nice. So nothing's changed. <laughs> Let's change gears slightly. Uh, let's, you're in a McDonald's, a converted McDonald's right now. Uh, you're yep. working on the Lunar Orbiter Data Recovery Project, which, by the way, just rolls right off the tongue. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about what you're doing. What we're doing here, and it's actually very consistent with what my larger message is here, is that uh, back in the Space Exploration Initiative era, 1989, 1990, <clears throat> I was working with lunar orbiter images because, frankly, that's all we had. Clementine hadn't flown. Uh, there had been no imaging missions to the moon uh, at that time. And a good friend of mine who's over here at Singularity University now, Eric Dahlstrom, <clears throat> handed me five rolls of microfilm and said, Dennis, you can do more with this than I can. Mm -hmm. Well, I look at these microfilm and it's all the lunar orbiter images. And lunar orbiter itself... There was five spacecraft that went to the moon in 1966 and 1967 as photo reconnaissance satellites to map out locations for lunar landing. And then later, the last two missions did a global map of the moon. Now, the quality of the images from Lunar Orbiter was not equaled until last year when Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter finally made it in the lunar orbit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and... I, so I worked with lunar orbiter images and all, and I actually knew about the original master data tapes that had higher quality images than what we were working with with the film. So I used to digitize these images and work with them and take a look at the moon. And so, but I'd heard about it in the early 90s an effort to do this, and I thought, oh, cool, I don't have to worry about it. Because <clears throat> I'd worked in a television studio running Ampex uh, television gear, and I, I knew that was the kind of machines. Well, I never heard anything else about it, and I figured, well, okay, that's just another thing that died. Well, in 2007, on nasaspaceflight.com, I saw a email thread, and there was a fellow who said that Nancy Evans, who was the NASA scientist on uh, uh, Viking, had save these tape drives for lunar orbiter and she was about to retire and she wasn't going to do this anymore Does, was there anybody who wanted these tape drives well i immediately jumped on it i called keith cowing who's from nasa watch and he and i <clears throat> started to uh to do this we went out there i looked at the drives they looked like they could be refurbished we called up Pete Warden up here at NASA Ames, who I've known for over 20 years, and said, Pete, can we come up here? And he says, yeah, sure. And so Keith, out of his own pocket, rented uh, two uh, moving trucks, and so we got JPL to release the tapes to Ames, and we went and picked up the tape drives at Nancy's and brought them up here to Ames and started raising money for the project. And now you're converting these, and we were talking a little <coughs> bit prior to the show uh, you're not just converting these to, you know, just recording them on video. You're recording these as uncompressed video files, and you don't have just a few reels that you're working with. You've got like, there's a there's a picture online that just shows like this floor covered in reels and stacks. In stacks, yeah, it's a absolutely. There's almost 1,500 tapes, oh and these are original two-inch analog tapes. And uh, for example, what we're doing is. The Ampex tape drives that we're using in, 19, in the mid-1960s cost $300,000. That's when a car cost 1000 and a house in Silicon Valley cost 10000 <laughs> oh <clears throat> And so, uh, And those tape drives built a whole bunch of the houses here in Silicon Valley in, in the 1960s yeah. from the people that worked at uh, Ampex right up here in Red, Redwood City. Um, 
So what we're doing uh, is that we're using an Apple Macintosh actually running on the Windows side to digitize at high data rate, uh, 10 times over sample, to be able to capture the data in its highest fidelity. And then we use various programs like Photoshop, Pygor, other programs to reassemble from the raw analog data these images. That's a lot of data. I mean, that's not just like a, that's an unfathomable amount of data. How do you, you how know, do you deal with that? It's only 39 gigabytes of tape. <laughs> Times how many tapes? 1478. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of data. It's only about 60 terabytes. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and you're talking about transporting, and I do think it's funny. It's so much data that the fastest way to transfer it at this point is sneaker net over anything else. Absolutely. You know, when we get ready, we'll, we'll get a bunch of hard drives, throw them in the truck, and drive down to JPL. And what's the story behind the McDonald's? Okay. Why the McDonald's? Well, you know, it's one of those weird things that you never think about the ramifications at the time, but afterwards it, it just, you know, goes weird on you. Right. <clears throat> um, the NASA Ames Research Park is Moffett Field Navy Base. Mm -hmm. uh, during the 1990s, it was decided to close this base down. And so you never shut anything down all at once. And NASA kind of took it over. But the Navy side has been slowly dying for the past 10 or 15 years. Well, in April of 2008, they closed the McDonald's here. Well, some of the buildings have been closed a long time, and we were looking for a building to work out of. And some of the buildings are kind of dilapidated, but we knew because we'd come in here and bought Big Macs, that the air conditioning worked pretty good in the McDonald's. And uh, Lynn Harper, one of the researchers here at, uh, at Ames Research Park, has said, hey, you know, they've got uh, uh, these fume hoods for the fridge fryers in there. If you're soldering, you could sit under there. I went, hey, that's a good idea. And we knew the air conditioning worked. And we said, okay, let's move into McDonald's. And Dr. Warden, and uh, the NASA Lunar Science Institute with Dr. Dave Morrison and Greg Schmidt, uh, they helped set it up. And so we were able to move in here. And NASA <clears throat> Headquarters Exploration Systems Mission Directorate, uh, Ken Davidian at first, and then there was Doug Comstock. Uh, he gave us some money, and John Olson and Mike Wargo and ESMD, they all funded this. And so we've been going uh, at it uh, whole hog since late last year to digitize about half of the images. And we really didn't quite get there, but we, we're, we're on a roll now. We've got all of our methods done and everything, and we're hoping that we're going to get an extension on the contract through the Science Mission Directorate uh, that will allow us to capture all the, the rest of the images. Now, can mere mortals get access to these images so you can see the Absolutely. work you're working on? Uh, at the NASA Lunar Science Institute website, we have the full resolution images, the raw images. Uh, we're going to have the raw data, the full tapes uh, that will be at uh, JPL in the National Space Science, uh, the NSSDC, the National Space Science Data Center. Mm -hmm. They'll be available there. Uh, our whole thing is enabling this for the public. Uh, we're, we're not holding anything back. Uh, you know, Dr. Warden, you know, all he said was just get rid of the alien cranes and the domes and the rest of it, anybody else can look at. Love it. All right, Dennis, your book, Moon Rush, is available now on ApogeeBooks.com. This is, I got to tell you, one of my top five favorite reads, uh, just in books in general, let alone for space. This is an awesome, awesome book, and it really does touch on not just the how, but more importantly, the why we should go to the moon. And so this is a great book. Everyone should pick it up. Um, and, uh, and where else can people find you online? Uh, oh, let me see. We're on moonviews.com, www.moonviews.com. We release images and we link back to NLSI all the time. Uh, I do articles on NASA Watch and, you know, uh, I, I've been on the internet since 1984. I ain't real hard to find.
<laughs> awesome. Dennis, stay with us. We're going to join you back in post-show. And if you have a minute, I'd actually like to see if we can rotate your computer around and get a little bit of a tour of Mick Not Williams. Not a problem. Awesome. All right. Stay with us. We'll be right back with you. For those of you joining us live, uh, we do have a free copy of Moon Rush given to us by Apogee to give away to you. And here's how you're going to win. There was a number in the Space Vidcast newsletter that was sent out, a particular number that I mentioned. At one. the end of the, there was, there was only one number. It was at the end of the newsletter. Hopefully you read it all the way to the end. All you have to do is tweet that number out, just at Space Vidcast and give me the number. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first person that I get the response of for the tweet will win this book. I need to know what that number is. So everyone right now, they're going to their email, they're, they're bringing up the newsletter. And if you didn't have the Space Vidcast newsletter, you can subscribe. It's totally free. Just go to spacevidcast.com on the right hand side. <laughs> Space Vidcast. This is Space Vidcast Live 316 for, Ju what is it, July 16th? It's not 316, it's 324 for July 16th, it is. 2010. My name is, my name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, is a beautiful, lovely, and wonderful Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We're your Space Vidcasters. And joining us tonight is Dennis Wingo. You might be familiar with some of his work over at the Orbital, Orbital Recovery Corporation, helping to develop ways to extend the lifespan of satellites. He also works uh, at, and this is actually where he's joining us from, at a McMoons, which is a converted McDonald's. And that's on the Lunar Orbiter Data Recovery Project. And tonight, he's going to join us to talk about his book, Moonrush. So Dennis, welcome to Space Vidcast. Thank you, thank you very much. I want one of those shirts. <laughs> yeah, these are awesome. These are the uh, these are the Yuri shirts. I think you can get them at the uh, Yuri'sNight.net website, or at, the, at least Tim, I think, hooked us up. Yeah. Tim Bailey, who is hopefully joining us in we'll the show. We'll get some links, Dennis. We'll, we'll hook you up. Cool. Hey, so let's get right yeah. into this. Um, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about the moon and why, because you know, Moon Rush is all about going, you know, going back to the moon and how it's sustainable. We did Apollo. We did flags and footprints. And you know, us as space geeks, we say, yeah, we should go back to the moon. We've got to go back to the moon and go on to Mars. But you know, my, my family and friends, they go, why? It doesn't impact me. Who cares? So the question for you, just to start it off, is why go to the moon? Who cares? Well, and the fact that in the general public that it is not more acknowledged why we go back to the moon is our own fault in the space advocacy world. Um, after the death of the Apollo program, uh, Werner von Braun set up the National Space Institute, which was later merged and became the National Space Society, to educate people of why it's important to do space exploration and development. And there is an unfortunate lag that happened after the Apollo era in developing, analyzing, and publishing the scientific results. And some of the scientific results from Apollo were simply not believed until this year. And I'll go into a little bit of that. And, but the reason the moon is important, and I put this in the tagline of my book, is that we go to Mars to take our civilization there. 
we go to the moon to help save our civilization here on the earth. Uh, you hear discussion all the time. It's in the blogosphere. It, Al Gore is one of the preachers of this, that uh, the earth doesn't have enough resources to sustain our civilization over time. And China and India and the United States and the Western world were eating up all the resources of the world. And I, as I explained in my book, uh, the World Wildlife Federation put out a press release saying that we would need the... In 1969, a group of astronauts changed the world. They walked on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. In 1972, our journey ended. We've never been back. 2010 begins a year of change. Private companies are working on next generation spaceships. Governments are looking to go back to the moon and on to Mars. It's time to look up and dream again. It's time to push humans into the cosmos. It's time to educate and engage the planet. It's time for...